everyone, and welcome. And on behalf of my partners, Ben Kaznoka, Eric Tornberg, and Adam Corey, welcome. And thank you for coming. And for uh, friends who are new to Village, we're all about a community of supporting founders. And we're backed by successful founders like Jeff Bezos or uh, Sarah Blakely. And um, we're also curating a network of angel investors and founders thank you, who are um, out to create the most helpful network in tech. And uh, we're here um, for this master class with uh, the amazing Julia Hartwell. And um, we'll have a little bit of Q&A and open it up to you to answer or to ask any questions. And then we'll have a networking reception. And we're so delighted to be here at the Delancey Street Foundation. If you're not familiar, we ask you to look at the program and see the amazing transformative work that this community does. And uh, for, uh, well, without further ado, please uh, let's give it up for Julia Hartz. Thank you. Great. And uh, Julia, we're gonna talk about a lot of serious stuff, culture and company building. We wanted to start with your beginning of your career in television and some stories of how you moved from television to being a tech company founder. Oh, wow. Well, I, I started my career in television basically in college. So I went to, well, I'm going to start all the way back. I grew, okay. up in, I grew up in Santa Cruz. And it's a very, for those of you who know Santa Cruz, it's a very small beachside town. Um, and I was a, a, a devoted ballerina. And um, my dream in life was to be a backup dancer for Janet Jackson. And um, I just went and saw Janet at the Chase Center on Saturday, and we all determined that I could be, in fact, a backup to the backup, in case anyone got injured. But alas, I have a day job. Um, so when my parents gave me the, the harsh news of, sure, you can go do that, but first you need to go to college, I pivoted from backup dancer Jan Jackson to um, broadcast journalism, because I figured, what could I do to parlay my skills into something that was a job? Found Pepperdine, got you know um, a crazy financial aid package to go to Pepperdine, which included three jobs and started taking my classes all at night in order to be able to fulfill all of my duties on campus and all, as well as having a, a paying job. And um, in the first semester realized I could not actually take on all this debt and do all this hard work to learn how to talk or tell the weather and I wasn't going to be the person that went to North Dakota to like break their career. So I switched to behind the scenes to production development. And at Pepperdine, you can actually major in television development. This is actually a major there, which is amazing. So I, I started to intern. And one of the great things about being from Pepperdine was that all the interns from UCLA and USC, you know, the stacks of resumes were this big. And the pep Pepperdine's so small, the stacks of resumes were this big. And so just practically, I could get higher quality internships in Hollywood. And my first internship was on the set of Friends. And I discovered during that internship that I hated production. <laughs> um, and so I went on to intern in the script library at New Regency. And I learned there that I hated how long it took to get a script made into a movie. I loved reading all the movies in script form. That was incredible. My job was literally to wait in the library until someone needed a copy of a script and then make the copy. So I had a lot of time to read. Um, and then I landed finally at, at, um, at MTV in the series development department, and I found my calling there, um, which was because cable was moving faster than network television. Television obviously moves faster than, than movies um, or feature length films. And right when I started, these guys sent in a demo tape that became jackass. And so I really got to see something from the ground up that became somewhat of a cultural like moment, and I like to say you're welcome or I'm sorry, but it was so <laughs> fun to work on something that was that sort of groundbreaking at the time. Totally. Um, and so I, I graduated on a Friday, and they made space for me to join the team on, on that Monday. Um, and so I just rolled right into, right into my career. And mind you, I've been working since I was 14. So my parents were like, of course you're going to start working on Monday. <laughs> um, 
and I, have, I have, haven't stopped yet. Um, but I, I really loved the creative aspect of um, marrying the business side. So I, I actually loved being an, a network executive, which is sort of typically thought of as the suit in the creative process. Um, but two things happened. Um, one was, you know, I moved on to FX Networks and started working on some epic shows like The Shield and Rescue Me and Nip, Nip Tuck. Tuck. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, if you think about it, Nip Tuck was, started, was created by Ryan Murphy who went on to do a lot of epic shows like Glee or An American Horror Story. He did Running With Scissors, the movie. Um, the Shield was groundbreaking and I worked on the season, the two seasons with Glenn Close. Um, so I had all these amazing opportunities, but two things happened. One was advertising revenue was starting to dry up, and so instead of, um, and this online thing was starting to happen, and so instead of, you know, uh, Rec like disrupting the business model, um, we were hearkening back to the 1950s and doing product placement deals. So part of my job as the lowest person on the totem pole was to be calling, you know, fielding the calls from Anheuser-Busch who wondered why Dennis Leary wasn't holding the Miller Lite bottle exactly the way, the way they wanted him to hold it, and Dennis Leary was wondering why he wasn't getting paid royalties to hold the Miller Lite bottle in the right way. <laughs> We're going to have you hold up some exactly. like, wine bottle. Yes. In <laughs> Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and, and, uh, and so that was weird, you know, and I mean, I'm, mind you, I'm 21, so I'm sort of like, hmm. Uh, it would cost, I, I'll never forget this, it cost $40,000 to make a microsite for The Shield. And that was every season. We had to pay another $40,000 to outsource this development work to create this interactive microsite. And that seemed weird. Um, and then the second thing that happened was I met Kevin, who sort of was the massive life disruptor for me. Because we met at a wedding. My boss from MTV married his classmate from Stanford. We sat next to each other during the ceremony. So this wasn't like a reception hookup. This was like during the ceremony, <laughs> full sobriety, we fall in love. And um, in the movies, that's called the meet cute when you have this moment. So what happened was Kevin kind of came barreling into my life. I'm 23, and he starts showing me what's happening in Silicon Valley. And Again, I grew up here, but I didn't really grow up here. And I, went, I was gone during sort of the boom and the bust eras. I was either too young or I was just in college. And so I started to see what was going on here through his eyes. And he was working on his second startup, Zoom, which was raising money, uh, the other Zoom, X-O-O-M. Um, and it was raising money for, um, to get past all the regulatory and compliance needs because they were doing something pretty crazy, which was international money transfer in micropayments to serve immigrants sending money back to their families post 9-11. So they launched literally two months after 9-11. Yeah. So that meant that you needed tens of millions of dollars to be able to have the licenses to move the money. And it became just really prohibitive and only people who were crazy would even try to create a platform that was doing this during that era. So I got to watch that. And, and what, is, what does that actually practically mean? Well, it means that I sat through endless, endless meetings where, or sessions where he pitched, you know, the 85-page slide deck. This was way back wow. when, so that was like still a thing. Um, and, and, you know, I'd act really interested. Um, <laughs> or I, I had sort of front row seats to some of the more interesting things that were, that were starting to be developed, like YouTube. So essentially, that screwed up my whole plan because I was going to be a network president and all of a sudden I realized that Hollywood was going to have a massive disruption from Silicon Valley and you know I needed to decide which team I was going to be on and so effectively I deserted Hollywood. Lucky for us. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky for me. I mean when I think about sort of that, that moment in time and, and what could have been it's like sliding doors for me, right? I like, know, there's a parallel universe where yeah. you're, you know, headed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. TV would have been much more successful if you'd stayed in it. No. But, <laughs> but now let's move to Eventbrite. And i um, curious about your vision from the beginning. And now, is what you envisioned alive today? Is it different? You know, what's interesting is I think one of the most gratifying parts of this journey for me, which was unexpected, uh, you know, I didn't set out to, to be on this journey and I'm wholeheartedly embracing it, but 
What is mostly gratify, most gratifying is that we're doing it exactly what we set out to do. And we were just talking with a few entrepreneurs and you know, people thought, we did it all wrong. So you're not supposed to start a company with your life partner. You're not supposed to um, uh, go horizontal and not actually pick a vertical to focus on first. You know, you're not supposed to just look for ways to keep dropping your price. Um, you know, we, we really, I think, did a lot of things, quote unquote, wrong in the early days that ended up being some of the most fundamental parts of our company and our business. And I, um, I, was, I was marveling at, you know, how if we hadn't made that um, decision to be fully self-service and completely horizontal, Eventbrite actually wouldn't exist today. It, it just would not exist. It would have been disrupted long ago or acquired or something, but it wouldn't exist as, as the independent platform, platform it is today, yeah. And that was interesting because I think um, during our earlier conversation, you alluded to the fact that there were competitors out there when you started. We have a lot, I mean, well, we have thousands of competitors. I think the last count was like 3,000 online ticketing platforms, which is, I think, a nod to the fact that it's incredibly low barriers to entry and um, sort of mind-boggling high barriers to scale. <laughs> so Eventbrite's the largest ticketing platform in existence by number of events and creators. Um, and we're number two by number of tickets and growing four times as fast as the number one. So wow. it's, it's, a, it's, you know, uh, pretty close in our future that we'll, we will be de facto the largest events platform, but we have a long way to go to, to, to actually maximize our potential or realize the full opportunity, which is really exciting. So it feels like this um, pretty charmed opportunity in existence. And how would you advise entrepreneurs, especially early stage entrepreneurs, to think about competition? Yeah. Well, I've learned a lot about competition as of late. So in the, in, against the backdrop of the term to existence, we've had the absolute hardest year of, I mean, I've had the hardest year of my life, we've had the hardest year of our company, it's just been, so I got a lot to share in terms of lessons learned. <laughs> um, and I'm way, we are way more interesting now. Um, but, uh, but in terms of, um, Sorry, what was the question? Oh, competition. How would oh, you advise? Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. In, in terms of competition, you know, we, we focused on not um, getting distracted by competition. We figured, you know, in the rear view mirror, there could be a lot going on, but if you start focusing on it, you're not actually looking at where you're driving. And so um, we have never obsessed about competition. That is not true. We have spent, uh, we've spent some unproductive time obsessing about competition only to realize that we shouldn't have obsessed about them. <laughs> so I would say as of late, we've gotten a lot better at not obsessing about them. However, in places like music where we have fierce competition and you know, we've been going through a very public um, integration and migration of, a, um, of an acquisition, a lot of competitors have have sharpened their tool set to come after us, and you know, I, I just have to like it's a it's a it's sort of in a weird way, kind of a fun thing to think about enacting revenge on them in the future. So I do I get it, like it kind of awakens the maybe more masculine side of me, but I also feel like we shouldn't waste time on things that aren't actually going to help us leapfrog forward. And sometimes you can get into a knife fight and realize like well, we've just wasted all this time and energy, yeah. there's bloodshed, and we haven't gotten to the 10X solution yet. So right. you always have to balance that and, mm -hmm. and understand, is it actually worth it? Or is it just kind of like your ego talking, which my ego is just talking. <laughs> and you mentioned, you're very successful, but you mentioned this was a challenging year. Can you mm. share, oh what's gosh. a big challenge that you faced and how did you get through it? I think in order to explain this year, you have to go back to 2016. So 2016 was the year that I took over as CEO officially, but it was a transitional year for us. We were, we needed to um, be growing faster. And so we did a lot of work in 2016 to streamline our sales processes, to start unlocking new opportunities of growth in our self sign on business. So about 95% of our users are self sign on, which is awesome. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, and that accounts for about half of our revenue. 
Um, and then 2017, all that work paid off. So it was like, you know, we had bent steel on our growth curves and, you know, we had um, reached cash flow break even. And it was just, it was great to feel that accomplishment. And that, it was all hard work. It was nothing kind of broke our way. Um, just sort of like that didn't come from a lot of hard work and focus. And then, and then I think we kind of like our eyes got pretty big. And so we, um, we, as part of our focus on one particular vertical, which we had launched in 2016 as a strategy um, to focus on independent music venues, we had the opportunity to acquire our largest competitor in North America. We did that acquisition of Ticketfly in the fourth quarter of 2017, in the first quarter of 2018, board meeting, we decide we're finally going public. 10, you know, 12 years later, we're doing this. This has been always been part of the plan. Let's go. We get focused. It's like um, making a baby. It's like nine months of, of incubation, and then you birth it, and, you know, and then it doesn't sleep. And you're like, holy shit. So um, I think I've learned a lot. So I think that in, the, in that sort of um, is like hyper growth curves where we acquired a business that's, you know, a sizable amount of revenue, but we have to retain that revenue. So it's a totally different equation than what you're used to in terms of organic growth. Yeah. Um, and then taking on, you know, the IPO readiness, doing things like changing our pricing, reorging our team. I mean, you name it, we did it. And basically, what happened was, I mean, really, it's like it's like a it's it, it was like a living nightmare. Uh, is all the debts came to collect at the same time. So we go public. And all of a sudden, we're, this is not, we're not a company where like, we discovered something we have to do as a public company that we're not doing, or there's some, like some weird stuff going on with accounting. It's more just, how predictable is your business? And so all of a sudden, the business became less predictable at the exact wrong time, yeah. right? So a um, whole host of other things happened too, to the point where I felt like, at some point, various times throughout this year, I'm like, this has to be a joke. Like, I, I can't <laughs> actually believe that so many things are going wrong at the same time. But it was. It was just this, like, domino effect. And part of me, you know, induced it as a leader, understanding that some things weren't working, and so I needed to make changes, and that change induces chaos and kind of creates more destabilization. Don't so, most tech companies call yeah. people weird It's a names. good one. Yeah. But um, so what do you think characterizes them? And how intentional were you from the beginning in, on culture? And well, I think this. I think this year has also caused us to be uh, very introspective. You know, when all of a sudden the music stops and you're sort of like, oh, people aren't like, it's not just like rainbows and unicorns and you know, and and beer pong. Like, what are we? Who? <laughs> what are we really about? Um, that's where the really interesting work starts happening. And so. In the work that we've done, I think two themes have emerged in terms of what makes a Breitling unique. So one is that Breitling's come to the table with the company first. I mean, it's it's there is such a void of destructive ego at Eventbrite that it's almost odd to the person who enters. I kind of have to like we just had a new CFO start, and I'm like, okay, so you're not going to run into people who are trying to take credit for work or jockeying for, for a position or stabbing each other in the back. It just doesn't exist here, but I want you to be prepared for that because I think it's actually kind of odd that it doesn't. <laughs> um, and like two weeks in, he's like, you're right. It's so weird that and this. do you recruit for that? Like, is there a screening yeah. criteria well, to I get think, those folks out? I think uh, culture mm -hmm. is reinforcing. So I think mm -hmm. that you, you hire for your values, but we also hire for what we think we want to build in the future of our company and we hire for like values. And so once that gets to scale, it starts reinforcing itself in the good and the bad, right? <laughs> so you have to be mindful of being okay of letting go of some parts of the, of the culture or saying this part of our culture actually sucks. Um, but you also have to, re I think it's, it's, it's very important to reinforce the, the goodness. And one of the things that is very good about Eventbrite is that there isn't that sort of I'm out for myself mentality, it gets rooted out really quickly. I mean, really, really quick. It's almost great. shocking how, how it gets rooted out. The second thing I think is, um, is sort of akin to that, which is um, a deep collaborative spirit. So really wanting everybody to win together rather than you know, it being more about you know, in it for yourself. So I guess they're interlocked, but I think that they, 
produce results that are different from other companies, and each company is unique. Not you know, there is literally no identical company, but it. Um, I think it sets it sets us up well to endure hard times, and there are these self healing properties of the Eventbrite culture that I don't take for granted, but that I know are there, so we can move through harder times. We can move through tough decisions, and at the end of the day, there's no question that we have each other's back. Now, underneath that, we have a ton of stuff to fix, and I think that this has been also a hard year for folks because when there is, you know, you feel the sense of negativity. It starts to make you see shadows and, you know, yeah. and so there has been tougher times for our culture in this last year and I think that's part of this process and this journey and I don't ever want to go on a journey that is not authentic and that's not straight down the, the I don't know, I'm going to use some weird golf, like the fairway, <laughs> you know, it's like I don't want to take the detour. I want to go through it um, because any tough situation is better, you learn more if you just go straight through it. Yeah. And what's a self-healing culture? So it's the um, ability to, to, um, uh, to recapture your equilibrium when bad th or unexpected things happen. Hmm. That's how I think of a self-healing yeah. culture. And you've um, said before that you have now a very distributed team, right, across 14 countries or 14, 14 offices? offices? 14 offices around the world, yeah. Um, and you have lost the mothership mentality. Mm. What does that mean? I don't know that I said that, but oh. that's cool. Um, well, our, I'll roll our research. Should, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe Coco said it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, okay, good, good, good. My brain back there. So um, <laughs> distributed. See, that's the distributed, yeah, distributed team in action. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we still. Oh, I don't know. We still struggle with this one because. Um, Quite some time ago, we started. We stopped using HQ as a mm. term because I just don't think it serves any purpose. But I think it still exists to some extent. So you know, the 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 principle is how do we distribute not only talent but decision making away from one place? Like the mental exercise is an asteroid hits San Francisco, what's going to happen to Eventbrite? And how do you think about? distributing real decision making and real autonomy to your global teams. Yep. And it's hard because it's humans are weird. We just uh, we operate in a way, I mean, frankly, we have this space in on Fifth and Brandon that is a 50,000 square foot square, right? So the notion is like we're all on one floor plate. We you can get to each other really quickly, and I can't tell you how often I realize that I haven't been to the blue corner in over a week, <laughs> right? Like you just don't, you don't move Venture, a lot, yeah. I, it, or, or at least I don't. And I think that's more like, maybe I'm, I'm giving myself too much credit, but I think that's sort of human nature. You get sure. into your zone and, um, and so it's, it's hard, but I think it, we make it a point and we make it a priority and we talk about it a lot. And over the years as, as we've grown and we've started to hire much more out of San Francisco, I think that we're getting closer to what we imagine a global networked company would look like versus um, a San Francisco company that happens to have offices all over the world. You have a forum for q and I believe mm -hmm. it's called Hearts to Hearts. Yes. And I'd love to just yeah. hear your lessons, what maybe some things that have gone well or not gone well about communications within a company as it goes from little to huge. Everything like Brightlings or Hearts to Hearts sucks after the development of that show, Silicon Valley. Like everything that, it's so close. It's so, it's too close. Um, Heart to Hearts was, was actually, Hearts to Hearts was um, coined by a product manager named um, uh, Ty White, uh, who when Kevin and I started doing open Q&A with the team, he was like, oh my God, it's like Hearts to Hearts, and it just stuck. And you know those moments where you're like, shit. And now, a decade later, it's still hearts to hearts or H to H. But it's our version. It's our version of, of like town hall or you know. Yep. Um, and I think that that you know what we do well there is we don't just do one big one. We do micro hearts to hearts is where we have smaller forums and um, you know I think just showing up and being reliable and being open and being vulnerable and being vulnerable means you seed the question that everybody's thinking but won't ask, right? Mm -hmm. Like you actually plant that question or 
um, you're sharing something that is maybe a little bit more, not too personal, but a little bit more personal. And, you know, I have to remind myself of that all the time. I think, like, in the panic of, you know, first year as a public company, I'm a first time CEO. Like, uh, there was a lot of, of white knuckle moments this year, and I think I sort of shut down a bit and forgot the human side of myself mm -hmm. that, you know, I think is helpful in, in the sure. workplace. Um, so these are forums where I can just be real with people, and um, and it's been it's been a wonderful part of our culture. I mean, it's just it's it's very simple, I love but it. we've been doing it for ten years, so um, the consistency is key. Great. Um, we also heard you have a job title in your company for head of anthropological research, <laughs> and I'm curious, is that true? And if so, what trends are you hearing about for? <laughs> for Eventbrite or for um, for all these founders out here, I don't really care about titles. I, I <laughs> clearly because uh, that's a that's a heady one. Um, the person in this role was my chief of staff for a year because her research background and her ability to understand our customers is amazing. So um, she can have whatever title she wants, but uh, she is focused and her team. Her I think it's a small team that she oversees of customer research folks, and we were talking about this. Um, you know, as you scale, like when you start building a company, it takes a step back. So why why is why is anthropological research important? Well, um, we deal in gathering and something that is on the Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? So connectedness. Uh, yes, this is another Silicon Valley moment. Um, <laughs> I am claiming one of the <laughs> Maslow hierarchy needs, uh, which is connectedness. Well, we find that to be the basis of why we exist and our mission. So um, while the word anthropological research is very heady, I think that understanding why people gather and how we can help enable those who, in, who actually are catalyzing those gatherings is really important. Um, her, practically, her team is customer research. And um, we are, in this stage where when you, so when you start out, you are either the customer or you are um, really, really, really like creepily stalking your early customers. Mm -hmm. We talked about yes. this. Or your user research team is, are your parents, uh, which in, in the case of us, we used uh, Kevin's dad to, to dog food the Eventbrite product. Um, and then you start to grow and you start to get data and you start to understand trends and you start to make assumptions about your customers, and you start to build product for the assumptions, which is basically the average and very broad. And then maybe you start to introduce voice to the customer, and you start to get really like fancy about it, and you have phone shadowing, and it basically just takes you farther and farther away from your customer, all mm -hmm. these like sort of newfangled ways of understanding your customer. So Eventbrite went through that, and we came out the other end realizing that we had lost touch with our customer. And, um, and imagine that we discovered this this year. And, uh, and so, you know, realigning ourselves around, hey, we have all this great data, awesome, but how do we get to the qualitative, how do we get to the, to the nuanced observed behavior, not just the, hey, you took a survey and you told us what you think, right. but you actually didn't show us what you do. And so part of Adele's purview is to actually embed with our creators, we you know, are very particularly interested in music venue owners. Mm -hmm. um, so getting in there and understanding how do they actually run their box office? And how do we take those insights and marry them with the qualitative research from surveys and then marry that with our voice of the customer program through serving our customers and then add in the data and create a more holistic view of who our creators are because they're, they're very different. I mean, there's a million Amazing. different yeah creators, or there are a million creators who are all very different on our platform today. And how do you balance something that a lot of founders think about, which is incremental improvements and then big ideas? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Because uh, right now, we, I, think, I think having this moment in time honestly caused us to be, to get back to basics. And to, um, my philosophy is never, like, never waste a crisis. So if you're going to be down and out, like you might as well take advantage of it. And I wouldn't say that I'm, that I would wish for this experience, but I could say that I find virtue in being in the sort of um, whether it's like in the in the stock market they call it the penalty box 
um, which is actually quite lovely. It's, it's, it's a nice space with a lot of, a lot of room. <laughs> People aren't bothering you. Yeah, not as many analysts Apathy. are calling you. It's, a yes. kind of, it's great. <laughs> um, and, um, and also, you know, resetting on some of, the, some of our, our areas of focus. I don't know. I, find, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I find that to be a great space. So part of, a, part of what we are thinking about is, you know, how do, we, how do we get back to what we are really great at and, um, and make sure, like, one of the great virtues of Eventbrite as a business and one of the reasons why investors like Henry Ellen Bogan love our business is because the business fundamentals are solid. And so how do we make sure that that's reinforced? and generating the growth that it should be generating to fund the future. So I'm pretty old school, and so I, it's, it's like I missed all these moments. Like, I'm a Gen Xer, so I missed being a millennial. Um, I, we started Eventbrite in 2006, so we bootstrapped the company, so we missed the era where money was literally falling from the tree. Yeah, the six weeks um, fundraising cycle. We yeah, had. exactly. I mean, <laughs> not, not to, that's not to, you know, everybody's going to go through their hard time, but um, money didn't used to fall from the trees. Like, it <laughs> used to be really hard to get. And, and I think that, um, you know, I think that part of what Eventbrite is is this self-reinforcing perpetual motion machine that just keeps growing and it keeps funding itself. And that's really great. And so making sure that's in pristine condition is job number one. But you asked this question about how do you think about big bets. What keeps me up at night is because we're really focused on that, which is great because that will future-proof the yep. company, especially in harsh environments, we're not spending as much time on the big moonshots. And so I need to rebalance, I need to balance that as we think about the future. And you know, having someone um, like Alani Baker, who just joined us as CFO, come on board. It's so great because he's seen this so many times that he's like, oh yeah, yeah, don't worry, we're gonna, you know, X, Y, Z this. And um, and and he has this like, I've seen this before mentality, which is just helpful, even if he's making it up. Um, and uh, I don't care. Like someone's just gotta tell me they've seen it because I haven't. Um, but it's it's you know I think that's a, that's. That's the next frontier for us, is how do we balance our investment portfolio of the future moonshots? Because there's so much that Eventbrite hasn't done that we should be doing. So for us, that's the, that's the big question mark, is wow. how quickly can we get to that future? And speaking of balance, you have a very balanced board in terms of um, gender diversity and, and other diversity in, your, um, in the culture. And what tips would you have for um, female founders or underrepresented founders? I'm pretty pragmatic about this, which is, you know, if you if you are creating a company and you want it to succeed for the long run, it probably should look something like the world in terms of demographic and makeup and, you know, perspective on so many different vectors. And I think Eventbrite gets a lot of credit for gender diversity or balance. We have a lot of work to do. Like if you look at our, um, but we took a photo of the hundred most senior leaders in the company at the beginning of the year. And we have a lot of work to do. We just have a lot of work to do. And I think it's always a work in progress. But I was not super proud of that picture because it was predominantly white, right? Mm -hmm. So there's just a, there's always a work in progress and a, and a, and a um, I, just a, a facing the truth. Like people need to talk about that. It's like, we, yeah, we, there's probably some articles that talk about that we put out that talk about our 50-50 female male split on the board and on the e staff and when we went public the NYSE went on their own volition went all the way back to 1984 archives to try to find a gender balanced podium like ours and they couldn't oh. and that was just our executive team like all of that's kind of bullshit it's just all kind of just you know hot air it's like what are you actually building and what does your community look like and how will that benefit your company's future. And undoubtedly, it will benefit your company's future if you're focused on diversity. And in, in, in order to get, I think of inclusion as the means to be a diverse company. Because if you're not thinking about inclusion, then you're not gonna be a diverse company because people aren't gonna wanna come work for your company, right? right? If they or don't feel like or, they belong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or stay. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just, I point out kind of where we have work to do because I think it's really important to not deify any company. And yes, I'm proud of our gender balance. And yes, I'm proud to be a female founder and um, a, rare, a rare 
female public company CEO, um, which is like bittersweet, but it's but it 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 is what it is, right? And so finding that purpose and finding that I care about Eventbrite. I care about what kind of community we are and what kind of company we are and what we bring to the world. And that's the lens I view it through. And I'm willing to be a model um, for other folks. I don't, I've never felt ready to be a role model, old enough or experienced enough, but I'm, I'm, I understand the importance of it. I, I've reached that place. According to Taylor, I'm about to go into menopause. So that's really exciting. <laughs> Does that resonate with anybody? No. Is Taylor even here? No. Oh, God. That's such a, there's somebody working on a menopause startup who yes. educated me on the age yeah. of early menopause, which yes. is 42, in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> was kind of shocking. So um, let's open it up to some questions. So I know that you've retained people at Eventbrite for a really long time. Yeah. Um, and so the question is, how do you hire well the first time, and then how do you nurture those people so successfully that you're able to retain them for a really long time? That's a great question because I only focus on the misses um, and what we can learn from that. So hiring well, I think, is about, well, what I've learned as of late is that hiring well is in large part an exercise of being objective. And starting with, I have learned this from Patty McCord, who was head of people at Netflix for a long yeah. time and helped to author the, the culture deck. And she was a huge proponent of starting with the abstract problem you're trying to solve. So at Eventbrite, we always start, any job rec starts with what is the problem we're trying to solve? What would be the skills that would contribute towards the most efficient and successful solve for this problem? What are the attributes we need from this person in order to be the most successful at solving this problem most efficiently. Like it all leads back to solving the problem most efficiently with the highest quality outcome. And then what is the experience that would lend itself to success in this role? And what kind of, um, how do we look outside the boundaries of the obvious experience that would lend itself to, this, to success in this role? Because I think that's where the really interesting hiring starts. Um, and then we start looking at resumes. And so I think that that process, when it's well run and well calibrated and articulated, leads to higher success rates. But then there's so much in that practice that has to do with what happens when someone lands at the company, what kind of manager they have, what kind of skills that manager has, what kind of skills that person has, how do they work through problems, what happens when the going gets tough, and unfortunately, you don't really find that out until about nine to 12 months in, right? Because everybody's playing nice until then. <laughs> um, so, or not putting pressure on this person because, oh, they're new. So it's, um, it's a process. And I think that, that yes, we do have, um, gosh, a fair amount of Brightlings who have been at a Bright from you know, seven to, to 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. And I think in the instances where that has worked, almost every single, well, Literally, yeah, almost every single one of those Brightlings has moved around and had the windiest career path that you could imagine. I mean, it wouldn't even make sense if you were to look at it on paper, but they've moved around the company and have been adaptable to new challenges and have oftentimes raised their hand to seek out new challenges, not based on title or promotion or ego, but based on a new problem they wanted to solve for Eventbrite. What do you think is the next category of products and services that will truly revolutionize the way we live and interact with each other? Oh, wow. Um, Joe Varshney Verisim is revolutioni revolutionizing the animal testing space by using a platform and AI that mimics more human um, interactions with medications and whatnot. And I think that, you know, when we. <laughs> We just hosted this event for UCSF at our home, and I'm on the board, and it was a women in science event to basically bring families together with the, what science looks like, and what we don't typically see, um, which are women scientists running these amazing research labs, and almost everybody was working with mice. And my, what I hadn't thought of, I think for obvious reasons, was A, how visceral that would be to my daughter, who was an animal lover, the seven-year-old, and how upset she'd be about this whole mice situation by the end of the day. And so when you think about what we can do with technology to bring precision to me medicine, but also 
to change a very archaic practice. I mean, by the end of the day, I was like, where do the mice go? I need to know where the mice go. <laughs> you and don't want to know I where gotta the know. mice go. I got to know. I got, you know, it's like you don't want to think about it. Um, but to break status quo and also bring precision to human wellness, I think, is an indication of where these, um, where we're entering an entirely new reality um, where how lucky are we to, to, to be living on the cusp of all this automation and AI and, you know, and when we talk about robots taking over the world, but think about sort of the benefits of that, but yet we'll be the ones who remember when we used to do things to mice to get an indication as to whether or not something will harm a human and how messed up that is and not accurate, right? So I think that for me is, is really interesting. Um, I also think the accessibility of, of, you know, um, of mobile technology to underserved communities and then uh, people who are building things on top of that like um, um, Compound and yes, yeah, name, Amanda, Amanda, Amanda Payton. Um, mm -hmm. is, is an extension of what Kevin worked on in, uh, on Zoom, which is now a part of PayPal, um, and focused on the democratization um, of money transfer and of payments. And I think that, that that story has just not even played itself out yet. And you know, we wouldn't even be here, frankly, if it weren't for a company like PayPal to have discovered what they could discover in terms of democratizing merchant processing. And how exciting that is to think about mobile technology and locking that for underserved communities that don't have access to traditional banking um, and how game changing that is. So those are two areas that I'm super excited about. And then if you had Kevin up here, he'd give you 12 more. So I get to just write, I get to be his ride or die on, <laughs> on uh, funding the unfundable, if that makes sense. Interesting in the, the early days, if you can remember that far back. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you had a, a horizontal strategy right from, mm -hmm. from the beginning. How did you get out of the gate? I mean, was there a, a vertical that you ended up focusing yeah. on? Was it kind of crossing the chasm, or was it purely a horizontal approach? Yeah, we talked a lot about this earlier. I think um, you know the, uh, the earliest adopter group for us were tech bloggers who were using the platform to charge for meetups and, and creating some professionalism around those meetups. So it was actually Michael Arrington and TechCrunch that started using Eventbrite far before that was like a thing. Um, and you know, I think for us, we got really deep with that community. And we were talking about this notion of zero to 1,000 customers. And that was really our, our first 1,000 customers were in this media space, and which is, is interesting because it's such a huge industry yeah. now. Um, but I think observing how people use your product is one of, I think we overestimate how much we can glean from the usage of your product in unexpected ways. And so this, the, I can put myself back in the early days in a heartbeat. I mean, I'll, I'll like smell something or see something or even being down here reminds me of just being right back there, and it, it feels like yesterday. It's kind of like raising kids, it feels like yesterday. Um, but I think that uh, the second kind of user, the like most uh, uh, sort of prominently different group, uh, I'll never forget this day when um, somebody uh, published an event on the platform for a speed dating event in New York. So East Coast, totally different geography, you know, and uh, totally different format of event. And that was one of the most exciting days ever because we realized that, you know, people were finding the product and the platform and they were signing up organically and they were in an entirely different community. Um, really different community. And uh, now not so different. Tech meetups, speed dating, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm sorry, that was a really bad joke. Um, but Founder dating, that's kind of very we've heard of different. it. And, uh, and, and so I think you just being acutely observational about every move that our users made, to the point of like literally creepy. You know, we would observe and observe and observe and then follow the trends that they made. We still do that. You mentioned uh, creators with Eventbrite being a part of this broader community. And I also see a lot of companies that are creating spaces for their customers to come together. And so mm -hmm. what is Eventbrite doing to 
really facilitate that interaction and like the community ness of oh, Andy, creators. Yeah, we're not doing enough. <laughs> <laughs> we just had a meeting about this. We're like, we're an events platform that doesn't host events. Right. Discuss. <laughs> Um, we have, we, we are not tap, I'm, I'm literally like, we are not tapping into the opportunity to cultivate the community of event creators. And what we, what we find time and time again, whether, I mean, it's not true that we don't host. We host a music event, um, we host like meetups, we just had a bunch of Brazilian creators come up to San Francisco and tour Silicon Valley, which is like a thing that you can do now. It's actually a, cre it's a, so meta. It's a creator on Eventbrite who organizes these tours and you go to like Google, <laughs> Apple, Tesla. I'm like, can I come? I've never yeah, been sounds there. Fun. Um, and, uh, and the value in their three days together was resoundingly being together, not even going mm. to the fancy places. It was being together and sharing their best practices and connecting with one another and some of them had never met some of them were competitors. Some were in, you know, same space but different parts of the country. Um, and so I don't know how many times we need to remind ourselves of the fact that we can light this up and enable this in a really authentic way. We take um, inspiration from other companies like Airbnb, HubSpot, Etsy, um, all who have different ways of doing this. But I think scalable models, and so that's, that's, that's part of our future plan. Uh, and something that you know, I think is, is one of those things where you find yourself at this mature company at scale and you're public and you're like still not doing something that's so obvious. So for us, that's a really important part of our future. How do you build trust? And have your approaches and philosophy changed as you've grown? I, I'm only laughing because that's the, I'm about to go to our, our strategic planning offsite tomorrow and one of the key things we did the, it's a new executive team, about 40% uh, are new and you know we did the five dysfunctions. So trust is a big part of that. Um, we did the assessment, the table group, Patrick Lencioni. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I think trust is something that you have to build over time and can be lost in a heartbeat. And so it's one of those things where um, it compounds and it compounds with things like reliability and you know, being, um, being trustworthy in your, in your approach and also being consistent. It also is in micro actions and the ways in which you show up and the decisions you make and the context you give. So it's something that I think is vital to the success of an executive team or a company. And it's also, um, it can be, a, you, can, you can deviate towards a futile attempt to, to create trust. And so I think it's just not something that can be grown overnight. And I think at Eventbrite, we have had um, a very long run in building trust. And I think in the last year, we've eroded trust frankly, because we've made a lot of changes and there have been times when people didn't understand why we were making the change. And um, you can't expect to be performing at your highest if you don't have the trust. That's like, the, that's like to go back to my Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's, the physio, it's, it's akin to the physiological needs, it's the base layer. And so, you know, you can't fake it. And people try all the time, I and mean, they try to fake a good culture, or they try to fake building trust, or they do trust exercises, and all of that is just, again, futile. It's, it's really about showing up every day and walking the walk. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, for us, it's, it's a really important part of our future as we enter the next phase of Eventbrite. Um, and it's something that we don't take for granted. We want to thank you so much for your time and uh, for sharing uh, with thank all you. these founders. Thanks, and uh, thank you so much. Sure. And I think we have, oh, let's see. Oh, oh yes, 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 that's right. We have a gift. As you know, um, some people say, well, um, happy, you know, uh, happy people should be grateful. But we actually know that grateful people are happy. And so this is a little uh, gratitude journal. Thank you. Um, oh, I love it. The five minute journal. <laughs> this is awesome. So a couple of reflections every day. And again, thank you so much thank for you. sharing with us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you.